you know, I want to start off by thanking, thanking you so much for having me here today. I'm, I'm honored to be in your presence. So many of you out there I credit for saving my life, whether you're a doctor, a scientist, a, a journalist, an author, or one of the many that have tested HIV positive, um, that have just been in these trenches for a, a very long time and have walked this path long before I found this information out. It's because of you people here today that I'm standing here and that I'm alive. On that note, my journey through the AIDS machine, this is a, a picture of me at 26, five months after the birth of my first child, uh, three years before I had a positive HIV test. This all started um, in May of 1995. I had given birth to my second child via a C-section. Was in the hospital for a few days with that. They sent me home, uh, and within about 24 hours or so, um, I seemed to go downhill. The um, C-section was infected. It was swollen, red, inflamed. I had a very high fever, um, and my family rushed me back down to the emergency room with a, a low blood pressure, about 50 over 30, and they admitted me. Um, I spent the first week in intensive care and the uh, entire rest of the month of May in, in the hospital recovering, just pumped full of antibiotics and morphine and everything else. It had, the infection had gone systemic. My husband at the time is at home now with a brand new baby and a two and a half year old. I eventually get out of the hospital. What they had done was, um, while I was in there, they opened the section back up and uh, decided to leave it open and let it heal from the inside out. So every day and every night, they would come in and scrape it and irrigate it and pack it. And uh, when I went home, um, they sent me home with home health care nursing. And they did the same thing every day and every night for probably another six or eight weeks. It finally healed. I never really felt like I um, bounced back from this. Um, as the, the weeks and the months went on, um, I just didn't feel the same. I wasn't really sick with anything. I had no... Um, illness of any kind, <clears throat> just no energy left, um, very fatigued, very worn out, and I'm trying to deal with a new baby and a toddler. So I went back to my gynecologist and, and shared this with him, and he said, well, you know, you, you've been through a lot, your body's taken a, a big hit, you know, this could be some postpartum issues, um, just ride it out. Another month or so went by, and, and I, I didn't really feel any different. I had no energy, I just didn't feel the same as I used to. So I saw another doctor. Um, he advised me to take some Prozac, <laughs> which at the time I didn't think was a really great idea. Um, so I, I moved on. Um, another doctor tested me for um, a variety of things, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Everything was really coming up negative. In retrospect, I should have just left well enough alone. Um, if I probably would have waited long enough, I. I believe I probably would have made a, a recovery, but I didn't. I had a medical background. I worked as a paramedic, uh, and I worked in outpatient surgery for a few years. So I, there was something in me that was just saying, well, there's bound to be something wrong that a doctor and a pill could help. Um, this brings me up to about June of 1996. So now it's, it's been about a year later, and my son is a year old. Um, I go to a hematologist. And he's leading me at the time to believe this might be liver cancer or um, a liver issue based on um, some of the lab tests, maybe. But he says to me, um, have you ever had an HIV test? And I said, no, I don't believe I have. And he said, well, surely they must have done one with one of your pregnancies. And I said, well, maybe, but I don't remember signing anything. And I said to him, um, is that what you think it is? And he said, no. Not at all. White middle class women don't get AIDS. Hallelujah. <laughs> and I remember fi that was the first of many shocking statements I've heard since then. And I remember being shocked about that. Um, although I, I wasn't in a risk group, I, I was straight. I'd never used drugs. I had a handful of partners before my husband, all steady boyfriends. They were straight. They'd never used drugs. Uh, I had a needle stick 
in late 88. Um, but other than that, I was not in a risk category. So he says, well, we're, we'll just do it to cover all the bases. And I said, okay, that's fine. Um, I go home, and I'm, I'm not supposed to go back and see him for a couple of weeks. Well, his nurse calls me about three days later, and, and, and she's in a panic, and she says, um, Mrs. Stokely, you need to come back right away. Um, the doctor needs to see you. So in my mind, you know, I'm ticking that something's wrong. I've got liver cancer. I'm going to die. I call my husband, Joe, at, at work, and I said, you need to come home right away. We have to go back to the doctor's office. I'm dying of a liver cancer. So he comes home, and we, we rush over to this, uh, this hematologist's office. And it's one of those moments, what transpires next, where, where everything seems to slow down. We walk in, and I see the nurses from behind the glass peering out at us. And they, the one nurse brings us into a room, and she sits down, and she, doesn't, she sits us down. She doesn't say anything to us. Doctor will be with you in a minute. That was it. And we wait. A few minutes later, this young doctor comes walking in, and, and he's, he's shaking his head, and he's kind of looking down. And he says, and, and you could tell he was visibly shocked, your HIV test came back positive. And that's the moment where you've all experienced that, where everything starts to slow down, and, every, and I hear things in slow motion, and I'm feeling faint, and I hear my husband, he's, he's starting to cry, and he's saying, couldn't this be wrong? Are you sure? Should we get another test? And, I, and I, everything is very muffled and very surreal. And I remember him saying, oh no, it's right. These tests are right, and we even did the confirmatory test, the backup test. It proves it. So I, I, I just, I don't even know what to think. I'm devastated, and he says, you need to go. And they literally usher us out of the office. And he said, you need to go find an infectious diseases doctor. So fast forward um, a week later, I, I do. I have an appointment with an infectious diseases doctor. They draw um, the T cell count and the viral load. I'm 29 years old at the time. And um, they get the blood work back. And he said, well, your viral load count is 58,000. And your T cell count is 29. He said, you've obviously been infected a very long time. And, it, and then as we discussed, you know, the, the, any of the risk categories that I might have had, he said it's probably come from that needle stick back in the late 80s. <laughs> and I, I, I didn't know at the time. I didn't know any better. I go, okay, well, I've been infected a very long time. He said, you need to make out a will, get your affairs in order. You'll be lucky if you have six months. Then my husband and my two small babies have to get tested. It, the only thing worse than getting a positive HIV test, for those of you that know that, that have been through that, is waiting and, and literally having to help hold down your babies while they stick them and test them. My husband came back HIV negative, and that was after seven years of unprotected sex at the time. And both my children came back HIV negative. And, you know, in retrospect, again, we never questioned if this was a sexually transmitted disease, why he was HIV negative after seven years of unprotected sex. Um, but that's what they told us, and they said it was because we were lucky. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. One of many shocking statements. So we were very thankful for that, and, and I, I just, I... Uh, I was determined to start on these drugs. The doctor said, um, you know, we'll probably have to switch these out a lot before you die because the virus mutates really quickly and you won't be on any one of them for very long. They started me on AZT, 3TC, Crixivan, and Bactrim. I never missed a dose, um, took them faithfully, just like clockwork. I wanted to stay alive as long as I possibly could. Uh, this is uh, my daughter one year. This is still uh, a couple of years now before diagnosis. This is one month before I was diagnosed. This is six months after I started the drugs. Um, very noticeably I started to get anemic and pale right away and, and as the years went on I started um, having other little side effects that my doctor kept assuring me that's because you have full-blown AIDS. He said, it's HIV disease. And they never once told me that any of the, the things I was experiencing could possibly be coming from the drugs. I had full-blown AIDS, even though I was not sick 
with any opportunistic infection. So I took the drugs and I, I um, spoke with the local speakers bureau to all the colleges and the high schools and the juvenile detention centers and I parroted out every single thing they ever told me to without question. That was me after four years on uh, AZT, 3TC, and Crixivan, still very anemic, and I, ha I was losing a lot of hair um, at that point in time, along with a very distorted um, body. This was, uh, this was December 2006. So this was uh, about six, eight months, I guess, eight months before stopping the medicine. Um, what happened was, uh, we never questioned anything, we never knew there was another side to the AIDS debate. Um, and I, I, again, I faithfully took these drugs. I don't think I missed a dose maybe five times in 11 years. After about uh, four or five years into it, um, my doctor wanted to stop the Crixivan. He said it's doing damage to your liver. So we stopped that and they put me on Sestiva along with the AZT and the 3TC. And I took that, the Sestiva, up until, uh, until April of 2007. My husband happened to be on the internet one night. Um, I was out of town with my son. And he was, he was looking for something that a friend had sent him. He was just Googling, uh, searching for something that had nothing at all to do with HIV or AIDS. And all of a sudden, what pops up on the screen was um, Robin Scoville's video, The Other Side of AIDS. And this caught his attention right away because we didn't know there was another side to it. And he started watching the video. And then he looked and he looked longer and he started researching more. And, and the next morning, um, he says to me, uh, I found some things last night I think you ought to take a look at. And I said, OK. And I, I watched. I watched one video. I watched another video. I, I started reading. I found so many links. And I, I literally couldn't believe what I was seeing. And there were so many emotions as well. How, how did this, how did we not think to search any of this out for 11 years? It is, it's a well orchestrated campaign, I'll tell you that. Um, the censorship is incredible. Um, anyway, April of 2007, I spent uh, hours and hours and hours and read hundreds and thousands of pages of papers. I read everybody's book. Um, a lot of you I've been in contact with, and, and you've helped me along that journey, answered questions for me. And at that point, I decided that um, I probably didn't have a whole lot longer to live. That was uh, what I looked like. Um, at the time, I stopped the drugs, and I was going through a, a detoxification of them, which was very difficult in and of itself. Uh, I stopped everything, cold turkey, in April of 2007. And everything went downhill. I felt good for about one week. And then it seemed like everything was shutting down. I no longer could eat. Uh, I was having a hard time even drinking. Um, I couldn't walk. Everything on me hurt. I couldn't sleep. And it was, um, it, it was kind of like Groundhog Day. I would get up every day and sit on the couch and stare out the window. And every day was the same. And I. And it just seemed like everything in my, on, in my system was shutting down, and I didn't know why. And we didn't know what was happening. Um, but I, I worked through that. Um, we had a lot of support at the time. And by August, it must have been about three and a half, four months later, August of 2007, I finally started to kind of regain um, my, my body and my life back and slowly start coming out of this. I went back to my doctor, my HIV doctor. He did not know what I had done at the time. And he, so now I've been off the drugs about four months. I go back in, and what, how they did that was they would always um, draw my blood a week ahead of time. And then I would go back in for a visit with him. So I did this. And in my mind, it was kind of a, a one last time thing. Um, I'd always had a good relationship with him and his nurse. And I thought, I'm going to go in and tell them what I've done, and thinking they were going to support me in my decision. My uh, nurse calls me on the phone, and she's in a panic, and she says, Carrie, I think there's something wrong with your blood work. Are you coming in to see the doctor? And I said, uh, yeah. She says, well, either the lab has made a mistake, or um, y have you quit your drugs? And I was the model patient. And I said, well, you know, Nancy, actually I did. I stopped my drugs about four months ago. She says, well, your T-cell count is now down to 97. 